large language models were always just the foundation for what comes next. And so when we talk about this exponential growth curve in technology and capabilities, uh, AI agents are going to be at the forefront of that. And 2024, I think we're going to start to see more and more applications coming to consumers and to businesses in this space. Welcome to the Artificial Intelligence Show, the podcast that helps your business grow smarter by making AI approachable and actionable. My name is Paul Reitzer. I'm the founder and CEO of Marketing AI Institute, and I'm your host. Each week, I'm joined by my co-host and Marketing AI Institute Chief Content Officer, Mike Kaput, as we break down all the AI news that matters and give you insights and perspectives that you can use to advance your company and your career. Join us as we accelerate AI literacy for all. Welcome to episode 83 of the Artificial Intelligence Show. I'm your host, Paul Reitzer, along with my co-host, Mike Kaput. What's happening, Mike? Not much. How you doing, Paul? Good. Did you stay up for the Super Bowl last night? I stayed up for some of it. Okay. I, (laughs) I, I ended up sticking around the whole thing. I missed a bunch of ads. We'll talk about the ads and the AI ads in a few minutes, but... I missed a bunch of them. Like Mm. I I caught a few, but, um, all right. So you may have noticed in the introduction here already, a slight change to the name of the show. So since the show was created back in 2018, 19, whenever I first started doing it, it was the marketing AI show. And, uh, as many of you who listen may know, you may not be a marketer. (laughs) We have As the show has grown and expanded, um, our audience has become way more diverse and far-reaching than just the marketing industry. So we have CEOs, entrepreneurs, government leaders, educators, uh, administrators, uh, all listening to the show. And so in part of our kind of evolution here, we talked about uh, in the last couple episodes on, you know, a bit of our shift to the mission of AI literacy for all we uh, drop marketing from the name. So just the artificial intelligence show to kind of simplify things and I guess be more aligned with our current audience and where things are going. Now, the key here is nothing is changing. (laughs) Um, It's still going to be the same show, me and Mike doing the same thing, three main topics, rapid fire items. But it's funny, I've actually seen a lot of our uh, audience mention like, yeah, I just don't even say marketing when I say, hey, you got to listen to this show because people are referring people to the show who aren't marketers. So Mike and I will still provide the same perspective on marketing, sales, service, business that we always have. We're just dropping the marketing from the name to better align, as I said, with the people who listen to this show on a regular basis. So we appreciate all of you listening. We appreciate all you marketers that have been with us from the beginning and all you non-marketers that, uh, you know, the practitioners and business leaders and educational leaders and government leaders out there who uh, find value in the show every week. So we're grateful for you being a part of it. And like I said, nothing is changing. Content's going to be the same. Still going to be every Tuesday. Still going to drop every episode <laughs> uh, weekly. So stay tuned. Uh, there's going to be some other things we're going to be uh, introducing as kind of this mission evolves to this AI literacy for all movement. Um, but stay tuned on that. Nothing, nothing more to announce at the moment. All right, so the first episode of the Artificial Intelligence Show, but episode 60 or 83 overall. Uh, today's episode is brought to us by Marketing AI Institute's AI for Writers Summit, which is presented by Jasper. That is happening virtually on Wednesday, March 6th from 12 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Following the success of our inaugural AI for Writers Summit in March 2023, which had more than 4,000 writers, editors, and content marketers, we're excited to present the second edition of the uh, AI for Writers Summit. The agenda includes the state of AI and writing that I'm going to be presenting, generative AI writing tools and platforms you should know, which Mike is presenting. We're going to have generative AI insights from an IP attorney so you understand the legal landscape, the implications of copyright and both the training of the models and the use of those models. AI writing in the enterprise, we're going to go through a panel of opportunities and obstacles adopting AI for content creation. And then we're going to close it out with an AI in action rapid fire session showing a bunch of tech demos for writers and creators. Those are non-sponsored things. So this is legitimate, just like applications that we use internally. Tech we're excited about. We're going to show a bunch of demos there. 
And then there'll be an Ask Me Anything session at the end of that. And the best part, thanks to Jasper, it is free to attend. So there's a free ticket option for attending the live event. And then there's also a paid on-demand option and a private registration option as well. So go to AIWriterSummit.com. Again, that's AIWriterSummit.com to learn more. You can also find it under the Marketing AI Institute site under Events. And this episode is also brought to us by the brand new Piloting AI 2024 course series. The series is a collection of 18 on-demand courses designed as a step-by-step -step learning path for beginners at all levels from interns to CMOs. Mike and I take you on a journey that includes an overview of the basics of AI and how it works, deep dives into practical frameworks to get started, a brand new Generative AI 101 course, and dozens of sample use cases and AI tools that will accelerate your adoption and success. The series includes about nine hours of content complete with on-demand short courses, quizzes, downloadable resources, a final exam, and a professional certificate upon completion. Mike and I recorded all of the courses in January 2024, so you will get the latest information. Go to pilotingai.com to learn more and register today. All right, Mike, I got a flight to San Antonio. Let's get this thing going. It is February 12th. Uh, we're uh, 10 a.m., 10.20 a.m. Eastern time. Again, timestamps because there's a lot of chatter starting to emerge that we might be hearing from OpenAI at some point in the near future <laughs> on some like GPT-5 kind of news. So nothing official. Just again, like I said last week, we were hearing increasing murmurs about Gemini Ultra and that ended up happening last week. So usually you can kind of start to get a sense some things are are in the works so uh if anything happens to break this week we are recording on monday february 12th at 10 20 a.m all right let's go all right so our first big topic today paul is the one you just alluded to which is google has announced that from now on google bard will be known simply as google gemini now, in tandem with this renaming, Google announced Gemini Advanced, which is a paid subscription tier for $19.99 per month that gives you access to Google's most powerful model, Gemini Ultra. Now, with Gemini Advanced, you get access to what they're calling Ultra 1.0, which will also be available soon in Google Docs, Gmail, and other apps. Now, according to Google, Quote, Gemini Advanced is far more capable at reasoning, following instructions, coding, and creative inspiration. Now, early tests seem to indicate that that's pretty true. Wharton professor and AI expert Ethan Malik, who has had beta access to Gemini Advanced for about a month, he wrote a post in which he said that Gemini Advanced is clearly a GPT-4 class model. And he notes that while Gemini Advanced doesn't obviously blow away GPT-4, it is roughly equivalent, though it has its own strengths and weaknesses. Now, right now, uh, you can get two months free when you sign up for a Gemini Advanced subscription. But if you don't want to pony up 20 bucks a month, you can still use a weaker version of the Gemini family of models, Gemini Pro, simply by going to gemini.google.com. You can use that totally for free. So Paul, first step is Gemini Advanced slash Gemini Ultra. Finally, the GPT-4 competitor that we've been waiting for. It does seem to be, you know, this, so we did our podcast last week on Monday, which would have been, I think we recorded on the 5th, if I'm doing my math right. And then we had an intro to AI class last week on Thursday, I want to say, and we had like 1,800 people registered. And that morning at like 8 a.m., I was at the uh, the cafe. I was at uh, Joe's Deli, one of our favorite spots around town, and um, drinking a coffee. And I was getting ready for the intro presentation. And I, I see the tweet alert, like, Gemini Ultra now available. I was like, ah, oh, man, I still got to build this deck. And so I kind of raced in and, and created an account, got the subscription on my Gmail because uh, you can't get it through your corporate account yet. And I started kind of playing around with it. So, um, yeah, I just kind of threw my morning for a nice wrinkle that day. But I, I wanted to kind of take a step back because honestly, this, this is so confusing. Like, <laughs> which Gemini models do we have? What's it called? When did mm. they come out? Which ones are available? Which ones aren't? So I actually went back to our notes. And, and again, we've been talking about this. I feel like I, have, I actually went back to last week's uh, podcast 
brief that Mike and I have before we go on. And I was like, didn't we talk about this last week? And then I realized like, oh no, it came out after the fact, but we had alluded mm -hmm. it might. So December 6th, we'll rewind here. So like two months ago and six days, two months and six days ago, uh, Google announced Gemini. So on December 6th, 2023, a blog post from Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Alphabet and Google, and Demis Hassabis, the uh, lead of Google DeepMind and kind of the, the head of AI at Google. So they did a joint blog post announcing that Gemini was coming. So this, and I think Gemini Pro maybe became roughly available that day. This is again, where it gets mm. really confusing, but I thought it would be helpful to take a step back real quick and, and get the context of what exactly is going on with Gemini. Why is this a big deal? So in that blog post, which we will put in the show notes, if you, if you didn't read it, um, there is a, it starts with perspective from Sundar and then it has perspective from Dennis. And so Sundar says, every technology shift is an opportunity to advance scientific discovery, accelerate human progress, and improve lives. I believe the transition we are seeing right now with AI will be the most profound in our lifetimes, far bigger than the shift to mobile or to the web before it. AI has the potential to create opportunities from the everyday to the extraordinary for people everywhere. It will bring new waves of innovation and economic progress and drive knowledge, learning, creativity, and productivity on a scale we haven't seen before. He then goes on to say, now we're taking the next step on our journey with Gemini, our most capable and general model yet. With state-of-the-art performance across many leading benchmarks, our first version, Gemini 1.0, is optimized for different sizes, Ultra, Pro, and Nano. These are the first models of the Gemini era and the first realization of the vision we had when we formed Google DeepMind earlier this year. He's referring to when Google Brain and DeepMind merged into a single research lab at Google earlier in 2023. This new era of models represents one of the biggest science and engineering efforts we've undertaken as a company. I'm genuinely excited what's ahead and for the opportunities Gemini will unlock for people everywhere. Okay, so keep the macro level from Sundar in, in, in your mind, and I'll come back to why that matters in a moment. Demis in that post said, for a long time, we've wanted to build a generation of AI models inspired by the way people understand and interact with the world, AI that feels less like a smart piece of software and more like something useful and intuitive, an expert helper or assistant. Today, again, this is December 6, 2023, we are a step closer to this vision as we introduce Gemini, the most capable and general model we've ever built. Gemini is the result of large-scale collaborative efforts by teams across Google, including our colleagues at Google Research. It was built from the ground up to be multimodal, which means it can generalize and seamlessly understand, operate, and operate across and combine different types of information, including text, code, audio, image, and video. Okay, so that's kind of like the macro level at that moment in time, Bard was still Bard, <laughs> and now so that they've now kind of taken the complexity of the, you got the Gemini, you got Bard, you got Duet AI, which is the workspace version of all of this, and then you have Vertex AI, which is like the access to the APIs. I, I think basically, so if you're a developer, you're working with Vertex AI, so it gets really kind of complicated to follow. So I like the fact that the re branding Bard to Gemini. I, I think that makes sense. I actually tweeted at uh, Jack Krawcheck, who is uh, the product lead for Bard slash Gemini from Google. He's very active on Twitter. I would highly recommend following him. It's just at Jack K. Um, and he he's very engaged with users and he's constantly asking for feedback on Bard slash Gemini. So he's a good guy to follow, but I actually asked him, um, I said, I like the rebrand. Uh, is there any plans to, when I say, I like the rebrand Gemini. Now, can we change Duet AI for workspace to Gemini for work and clear up all the confusion? And he said, yes, part of AI premium will be access to Gemini in Gmail and Docs, formerly known as Duet AI. So as of this moment, Duet AI is still the workspace brand, as far as I know, at least when I looked this morning. But it sounds like they're going to drop that as well and, and just go with this Gemini brand. So. I did subscribe uh, through my personal Gmail, so I have access to Gemini Advanced now, which again is using their Ultra 1.0 model. 
Um, it also is available on my iPhone. So I have the Google app and you can now just toggle between regular Google search and Gemini advanced, which is kind of slick. So I like that. And I know on Android, you can get the, an app dedicated to Gemini. So you can definitely get in there and start doing it. They're giving you two months free. They're trying to get user trials here. So it's 1999 a month and then, but you get two months free. It seems like initially um, the main differentiator is that you can connect it to Google Flights, Google Hotels, Google Maps, Google Workspace, and YouTube. So there's what are, they call extensions, and you can turn these on. Um, now, I will say when you turn them on, they are very clear that they are going to use what you give them. So you actually, their privacy statement says, please don't enter confidential information in your conversations or any data you wouldn't want a reviewer to see or Google to use to improve our products, services, and machine learning technologies. And there's literally a warning that pops up at the top of your Google advanced screen that says, your conversations are processed by human reviewers to improve the technologies powering Gemini apps. Don't enter anything you wouldn't want a review, want reviewed or used. So just kind of some things to keep in mind. My experience so far, what I've been finding myself doing is when I have a prompt, um, I will actually go through and I have Gemini Advanced open, Chat GPT, and Perplexity. Those are kind of my three main ones that I'm exploring. Anthropic Claude's, you know, still great and everything. Um, but those are the three I'm playing with. And so I will often actually give the same prompt to all three of them. And mm -hmm. I will kind of see on an ongoing basis how they perform against each other in certain scenarios. So I don't have enough deep research yet not like ethan Malik's article um but it's it's definitely more powerful like you can really see it and so like my final thought here is when we go back to that context of what sundar and demis wrote on december 6 when they introduced gemini it, it really sticks in my mind because at the end of ethan Malik's post if you hung around for the the, the close he said that the question of why it doesn't clearly beat GPT-4 is really interesting and perhaps consequential. Now, again, keep in mind, GPT-4 has now been in the world for almost a year. It was March 2023, and it was built, it was finished seven months before it came out. So GPT-4 is basically like 19 or 20 months old in terms of a technology. So the fact that Google couldn't beat it is kind of weird with as fast as this stuff advances and improves that GPT-4 is still the top model after almost 20 months in existence is really perplexing, honestly, like if you think about it. And so Ethan presented four potential scenarios as to why that is, that, that Gemini Ultra isn't clearly beating GPT-4 yet. So he said, one, GPT-4 class models are about as good as AI gets using large language model technology, suggesting that the exponential change in AI capabilities is ending. He says, I think this is unlikely, but possible. Number two, Google needed a model to compete with GPT-4, so they trained up Gemini to that level and stopped. More advanced models are coming soon. Three, OpenAI has some special sauce that no other company can replicate, and they are the only ones who can easily achieve GPT-4 plus abilities. Google's attempt was the best they could do without knowing the OpenAI secret. And number four, it is a coincidence that this model happens to be so close in abilities to GPT-4, and we learn nothing from this. He says, I think two is most likely, but I have no idea if that is true. So if you go back to you know, this is the beginning, um, all the things that Demis and Sundar said, I feel quite strongly that number two is the answer. I, mm -hmm. I think that what we're seeing, one, isn't even the most powerful version of Ultra. Like, I I I'm almost positive that they have far more capabilities than we're accessing through Gemini Advanced at the moment. They haven't even integrated all the modalities into this thing yet. So I think, one, they're probably holding back some capabilities to they likely could have continued training this and maybe they did and and just didn't release it mm. so i do think that we're really just at the very beginning of what these things are going to be able to do 
I think we're going to probably see Llama 3 from Meta at some point, maybe in Q1. It seems more and more like we may see chat GPT um, improve with a GPT-5 or some other iteration. Even they were vague tweeting last night, the chat GPT app said something like, think step by step. Like they're starting to sort of like tweet things that imply something else is around the corner. Mm. So I, I feel like this is a really important thing. I, I wouldn't, if you're paying 20 bucks a month for ChatGPT Plus, I guess my big takeaway here, if you're already paying 20 bucks a month for ChatGPT Plus, I don't think you're going to get some leap forward in capabilities for another $20 a month from this. But as we talked about last week, Google has massive distribution. You're already in Google search all day long. You're already in Chrome all day long. And I think that distribution may end up being one of the biggest factors for adoption for them. Um, so I will continue to pay for it because I'm experimenting with it, not because I found some application here for Gemini Advanced that gives me some amazing capabilities I don't already have through ChatGPT. It's, it's research for us. Yeah. So in our second big topic this week, it is becoming more apparent every single day that AI agents are becoming a reality and they're becoming a reality fast. Um, by AI agents, we mean autonomous AI systems that can take actions for you on your behalf. So according to a recent report in the information, OpenAI is, quote, developing a form of agent software to automate complex tasks by effectively taking over a customer's device. This agent would perform clicks, cursor movements, typing, and other actions required by humans to operate different apps. And that's according to a person with knowledge of the effort who the information interviewed. Now, there are also plenty of buzzworthy startups that are trying to build these types of AI agents. Our friends at HyperWrite have been working on their personal assistant AI agent for some time now. And they released Agent Trainer and Agent Studio, which are new features that give you the ability to train AI agents just by recording what you're doing on your screen for any given workflow or interaction with an app. Uh, says Matt Schumer at Hyperite on X, this represents a major step forward in usability and accessibility for AI agents. No more prompting. Soon, Hyperite users will be able to customize their personal assistant and teach it to automate repetitive tasks in a fraction of the time. They're not the only startup working on this. There are companies uh, like the new buzzworthy startup Multion and Adept, which is an existing player who's raised hundreds of millions of dollars. So, Paul, it's actually interesting timing here because it's been almost a year since you first published an article on our website called World of Bits and basically predicted this imminent rise of AI agents. And in that article, you said, quote, when you start connecting the dots, it appears that we are moving toward a world in which AI agents will not only retrieve and present information and answers, but have the ability to take actions in the digital world. This changes things, likely in ways for which marketers, business leaders, software entrepreneurs, and humans in general are not prepared. Can you walk us a bit through that post, kind of why you wrote it, why it matters today, and what's changed, if anything, since you wrote it? Yeah, I think, so we talked about this in episode 35, so if you want to like go back and rewind and kind of listen to the whole thing, uh, we'll also put the link in the show notes, but I for the original article, but I, I think it is helpful to go back and kind of give the context here. So if we, if we go back to that article, I'll just kind of read a few excerpts for you because it, it gives really good context as to what's going on and, and kind of where this is going. So the article said, we are so caught up right now in figuring out AI writing tools and large language models that most marketing and business leaders, as well as SaaS executives, software as a service executives, and investors are missing the bigger picture. This is all just the foundation for what comes next. Let's look at email marketing as a practical example of what I mean. Imagine you want to send an email promoting an upcoming event, product launch, or promotion, but rather than a series of clicks and manual entries, you simply spoke or typed prompts for what you wanted the machine, aka the AI, to do. I did later in the post share the example of HubSpot. Like if I wanted to send an email in HubSpot, it takes a minimum of 21 clicks. So this example of, I can just give a voice prompt or a text prompt instead of clicking around 21 times within HubSpot. 
So the article went on to say, I'm not talking about simple information retrieval and natural language generation, such, such as a chat feature that responds to queries and prompts. I'm saying that the AI will have the ability to perform actions, clicks, form fills, etc., the same way as humans, based on a collection of public AI research papers related to a concept called world of bits, and in light of recent events and milestones in the AI industry, including legendary AI researcher Andrzej Karpathy announcing his return to OpenAI, which was in February of 2023, it appears the capabilities for AI systems to use a keyboard and mouse are being developed in major AI research labs right now. This has been attempted in the past, but recent advancements in language AI appear to be bringing this closer to reality. If AI develops these abilities at scale, the user experience of every software company will have to be reimagined and it will have profound impacts on productivity, the economy, and human labor. Later in the article, I went on to say, in a 2017 research paper called World of Bits, an open domain platform for web-based agents, Karpathy and other authors explored the potential of AI agents to complete tasks such as booking flights and completing forms through simulated usage of a keyboard and mouse. They made progress, but obstacles remain. In the conclusion of that paper, it said, in this paper, we introduced World of Bits, a platform that allows agents to complete web tasks with keyboard and mouse actions. Unlike most existing reinforcement learning platforms, World of Bits offers the opportunity to tackle realistic, realistic tasks at scale. We showed that while standard supervised and reinforcement learning techniques can be applied to achieve adequate results across these environments, the gap between agents and humans remains large and welcomes additional modeling advances. It was around that time that Karpathy left OpenAI and went to head up AI and computer vision at Tesla. Then in October 2022, so a few months before we're talking about in February, uh, he did an interview on the Lex Friedman podcast, which Mike and I are both huge fans of. And in that interview, he implied that those barriers that they talked about in the conclusion to the 2017 paper uh, were coming down. So Friedman said, you briefly worked on a project called World of Bits, training a reinforcement learning system to take actions on the internet versus just consuming the internet like we talked about. Uh, he went on to say, do you think there's a future for that kind of system interacting with the internet to help learning? Karpathy said, yes, I think that's probably the final frontier for a lot of these models. When I was at OpenAI, I was working on World of Bits, and basically it was the idea of giving them access to the keyboard and mouse. And the idea is basically you perceive the input of the screen and you're able to take actions. Uh, he went on to say, now to your question as to what I learned, it's interesting because World of Bits was basically too early at OpenAI. This is around 2015 when they were working on it. He did then go on to say, it is time to revisit that. And OpenAI is interested in this. Companies like Adept are interested in this and so on. And the idea is coming back because the interface is very powerful. But now you're not training an agent from scratch. You're, you are taking the GPT as an initialization. This is the real key part as to kind of where we are today. So GPT is pre-trained on all of the text and it understands what a booking is. It understands what a submit is. It understands quite a bit more. And so it already has those representations. They are very powerful, and that makes all the training significantly more efficient and makes the problem tractable. And if you remember a few episodes back, we talked about Karpathy's YouTube video where he talked about the future of AI agents. And in that, when he said, what are kind of the next frontier of large language models, he said it can use the existing software infrastructure, like a calculator, a mouse, a keyboard. Then a, a couple of quick notes. The one thing I found interesting is I was, you know, kind of follow along here, a guy named Ben Newhouse, who works on agents at OpenAI, um, tweeted on January 25th that he was, uh, I'm hiring at OpenAI. We're building what I think could be an industry defining zero to one product that leverages the latest and greatest from our upcoming models. If you'd like product, deep techno technological challenges. And writing the future, my DMs are open. So he was recruiting. But the, the thing that caught my attention was a guy named Peter Wellander, who's VP of product at OpenAI, retweeted that again on January 25th and said, this product will change everything. So OpenAI's VPs don't usually tweet things like this product will change everything unless they actually believe it will. 
And so I believe they're referring to their progress on AI agents. And so that before we even saw the information article last week was sort of my tip off that they, they're making significant progress. And so I think the key takeaway for everyone here is um, large language models were always just the foundation for what comes next. They have unlocked the ability to build AI agents. They will unlock the next iteration of robotics because the robots can Im embody the, the, the language models, the intelligence. And so when we talk about this exponential growth curve in technology and capabilities, uh, AI agents are going to be at the forefront of that. And 2024, I think we're going to start to see more and more applications coming to consumers and to businesses in this space. So to kind of wrap this up, if I'm a marketer, marketing leader, business leader, like how can I even start to prepare for the near-term implications of how much this will change? It's well, if you're willing to give access to everything you do on your computer, you can probably start testing them with something like a HyperWrite or mm -hmm. Multion. I personally am not. So <laughs> I follow along <clears throat> in the space and listen closely to what's happening and what's going on in the research labs and watch the demos. But I'm not at a point where I would personally trust these companies to have access to that. But like I said in the past episodes, like, once Google does this or Apple, and they already have all my data, I'm far more likely to say, all right, I'll give it a go. Um, mm. but for me personally, I I'm not willing to give up that privacy and data to startups at, at the moment. Um, so I think again, it's kind of one of those, the law of uneven AI distribution that I wrote, you know, a year plus ago, like we're all going to have the ability to have the benefits, but you have to be willing to accept what you have to give up to get the benefit. Mm -hmm. And so in the case of AI agents, personally, I'm not willing to give up the privacy um, that it would take to, to start testing these tools. So in our third uh, big topic this week, another open AI uh, themed topic here, because Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, is actually reported to be in talks to raise as much as five to seven trillion dollars to dramatically increase the chip building capacity needed to power the AI revolution. The investors included in raising this money could include the United Arab Emirates government, according to reporting from the Wall Street Journal that outlined the beginnings of this project. Now, this comes after Altman was reportedly trying late last year to get OpenAI into the chip business, which is an effort that caused some controversy at OpenAI and is suspected, at least in part, to have motivated all the drama and the failed coup against Altman. Now, details are pretty scant at the moment, but this money supposedly would fund a project to boost the world's chip building capacity. And what's crazy about this is the numbers being talked about with the five to seven trillion being raised would just dwarf the current size of the global chip industry. Um, it is expected to be worth $1 trillion annually by 2030, according to estimates from the Wall Street Journal. So, Paul, why, first up, are we even talking about numbers of this size when it comes to chip making? Like, why is chip making so important to AI innovation and progress? So the, all the generative AI capabilities that we're all experiencing today are powered by largely NVIDIA chips, which are made in Taiwan. Um, so there's been a, you know, kind of a, certainly an effort in the United States, um, probably, you know, more broadly from a global perspective to diversify and expand the chip industry. So it's not centered in a single country. There's more, um, uh, I, I guess volume, um, more innovation happening outside of the, f the fabrication plants in, in Taiwan. So there's a much bigger story there, but like this kind of money, it's not just chips. Like they're looking at basically what Sam is doing is they're looking out ahead and saying, okay, in seven to 10 years to do what we're envisioning at OpenAI, whatever it is that their long-term vision believes AI is going to be capable of, they're obviously envisioning a world where we need way more uh, ability to build chips. We need significantly greater clean energy, and we need a lot more data centers and in addition to everything else. In addition to the talent that's able to, 
build and, and enable these uh, advancements. So he tweeted the afternoon before the Wall Street Journal article came out. So obviously mm -hmm. he was aware this article was coming. I'm sure they you know checked with them to verify information and things. So he did sort of pre-tweet the article and said, we believe the world needs more AI infrastructure, fab capacity, energy, data centers, et cetera, than people are currently planning to build. Building massive scale AI infrastructure and a resilient supply chain is crucial to economic competitiveness. Open AI will try to help. Um, so again, we don't know much. They, they haven't you know, confirmed these kinds of details or these numbers. Um, but the, the three things that I observed when I read this was, one, I would assume these efforts uh, may have something to do with his temporary ouster, for sure. Mm. If this was all happening under the OpenAI nonprofit umbrella, so if Sam was actively going out and talking to people about this kind of raise to do this rapid acceleration, um, and he wasn't disclosing those conversations to the board, that could certainly be uh, perceived as a pretty significant deviation from their original nonprofit charter and mission. So again, not 100% verified anywhere, but th you can kind of connect some dots here that that is likely at least has some, some part in that. The second is, as we have said many, many times, the AI you see and use today is the least capable we will ever have in human history. OpenAI appears to believe, as do many others, that we have not hit a ceiling, going back to Ethan Mollick's, you know, possible reasons why Gemini Advanced isn't more powerful than GPT-4. Mm -hmm. We have not hit a ceiling, ceiling for what these models can do. They appear to still be following scaling laws that if you throw more data and more energy capacity and more chips or computing power, maybe with a scientific breakthrough too, that we can certainly enter the realm of general intelligence and maybe even super intelligence. That if we just keep powering through this and grinding and putting more compute power, more energy, that we're going to build much more intelligent AI. And then the third is just the importance of understanding the chip industry. Again, if you've invested in or followed NVIDIA for the last you know, few years, you have certainly seen a, a, ra a rapid acceleration in their market cap and value of that stock. This is why it is powering the entire, you know, AI age that we are experiencing. So I would suggest there to read Chip War by Chris Miller. It's a phenomenal book. Once I read it, I had a totally different perspective on the geopolitical climate, um, as well as the complexity of doing this. Like, it's like, well, let's just build some fabrication plants in the U.S. How is this so hard? And you realize how much engineering and, and what kind of advanced talent is needed to mm. build and maintain these fabrication facilities. Um, it, it's truly some of the most advanced science that we've achieved in human history. So it's not like you can just pick a plot of land and, and build one of these things. So um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's a really important topic and I think we'll probably talk more about it moving forward. But the main point here is you need to be paying attention to this, whether or not OpenAI raises five to seven trillion, who knows? I mean, that's, it's such an absurd thing to <laughs> even consider being reality. I wouldn't put anything past Sam, but um, it, it's more of the idea that they're thinking this big and they're thinking this long term that I believe is worth paying attention to. All right. We've got a bunch of rapid fire topics this week to cover. Uh, first step is that some investors appear to be deciding not to invest in open AI and some other AI startups, according to reports from the information. Uh, according to the report, quote, for the past year, owning a stake in open AI was akin to possessing Silicon Valley gold, signaling that the investor had a ticket to the next great tech transformation. But as the valuation of the startup has tripled, some investors have refrained from buying more and a number of marquee venture capital firms have shied away from investing in dozens of artificial intelligence startups out of fears that the sector is too competitive and prices are too high. Now, this includes VC firms like Founders Fund, Sequoia, and Coastal Ventures, all very well-known VC firms. And some appear to have concerns that OpenAI is not worth investing in at its new $86 billion valuation, which has arrived at late last year, 
when it sold off some employee and investor shares. Others, however, see OpenAI's lead as so significant that even AI startups twice as efficient aren't enough, according to one investor at Founders Fund, and yet others worry that the sector is too competitive. With Microsoft, Amazon, and Google, they predict ultimately winning out because they have the money to take on all comers. Now, Paul, what's going on here? Is investor demand for AI cooling off? I mean, it, there's certainly plenty of money went into AI companies in 2023 and more is going in in 2024. I, I think it's one article with one angle to consider. Um, at a high level, I don't disagree on the competitive side. We talked about this on last week's episode. I think that it's really hard for me to see Microsoft, Amazon, Google losing. Like mm. they're... Um, there are going to be a lot of these software companies that are going to raise hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars that will not exist in three to five years. Like there, there's going to be a bunch of them that just didn't have a strong enough moat, couldn't keep up. And once, you know, the, the big models start coming out from these big companies becomes very hard to differentiate. So I understand, um, this challenge. I, I think, I don't know if I've shared this before on the show, but like I looked at, at starting uh, an AI venture fund, like, you know, as recently as probably six to eight months ago, we were looking at, you know, building our own studio and raising a significant amount of money and starting to invest in and build AI software. And at the time I, I stepped back and said, I don't know what to bet on. Like I, I had a really hard time envisioning what software companies were going to be defensible. And so to me, it wasn't the right time for me personally to start getting in and making big bets on this stuff because as close as I am to the space, I, I just couldn't tell who was going to win and who wasn't. And I kind of still feel the same way. I, if I was investing in software companies, I would be extremely uh, hesitant to do it unless I felt very, very confident that they had a unique distribution model, proprietary data that was going to differentiate, or just such a clear advantage in some vertical that was going to make it so even if the general models became capable of doing what they were doing, they wouldn't have the audience within a vertical. So almost like if you have a media company within a specific vertical where you have 100,000 potential customers and you can offer some specific capability to that vertical. So that was you know, how I looked at it as an investor and you know, someone who was potentially going to start building things. Um, and I still feel very similar. I, I think a lot of these software companies are going to be obsoleted at some point. Um, I think a lot of the big tech companies, they're, they're going to win one way or the other. That being said, the timing is really fascinating here. So that inf information article came out on February 6th that people are like getting hesitant to invest in open AI at, mm. at this $100 billion valuation, whatever it is. And then two days later, the Wall Street Journal has an article saying open AI is going to raise like five to seven trillion. As someone who spent some time in the PR industry, it just kind of seems a little interesting and... um so basically like, oh, you don't think we're worth a hundred billion? Well, we're raising five to seven trillion. So mm -hmm. either get in now or don't don't get in kind of thing. Again, I don't I don't know, like, but usually there's there's something to the timing of these things. So I don't put a ton of weight necessarily in this. I don't think OpenAI is gonna have any problem finding investors at their eighty six to hundred billion dollar valuation. And I would imagine that the bigger vision for what they're trying to do over the next decade with AI infrastructure under the AI, open AI umbrella um, would enable them to probably justify whatever valuation they choose to use to raise money. So I wouldn't be crying for open AI if you don't <laughs> think they're going to get the, that valuation or enough investors in at that valuation. It's, uh, I, I don't think they're going to have a problem. <laughs> AI was not the star of the big game, but it did play a supporting role in this year's crop of ads during the big game. So we actually saw two AI focused ads from major AI players that aired during the event. One was for Microsoft Copilot, which is of course the company's AI assistant that works in Microsoft apps. The other showed off some AI features in Google's Pixel 8 phone, specifically some accessibility features. 
A handful of other ads promoted AI features in certain products. Etsy ran an ad about its new gift mode feature, which is powered by AI and helps shoppers select gifts. Cybersecurity firm CrowdStrike touted its ability to use AI to protect against cyber attacks. And one ad, which was a movie trailer for Despicable Me 4, even poked fun at AI, showing the franchise's dim-witted minion characters flooding the internet with bad AI-generated <laughs> images, like people with too many arms and fingers and stuff like that. So, Paul, during this, did anything jump out to you about, you know, AI's role in this year's ads? Yeah, I, I think we'd kind of joked like the over-under on, you know, how many ads would have AI in it. And I think I said 10, maybe. So I was close. I thought, so Marty Swant, who's from Digiday, uh, he had been tweeting some of this stuff. And so he had an article about this, but he had, uh, let's see, Microsoft, Google, Etsy. So that's three. And then Samsung, CrowdStrike, four, five. Uh, you mentioned the Minions one, six. Uh, Galaxy, oh, that's Samsung. Um, and then the one that you and I couldn't find, but like, yeah. I, so I was, I was watching the game, but I was working and then I was getting my kids ready for bed. So I missed some of these, but I saw a bunch of like AI people like, oh, the Anthropic ad. I can't believe they spent money on this. It, it's like, there's an Anthropic ad and mm -hmm. I've searched for, I cannot find the video of the ad. So I, I don't, maybe you saw it. Um, I did not. <laughs> okay. So apparently couldn't there was an Anthropic it. ad, but it was like five <laughs> seconds long. So okay. the, the 30 second ads were $7 million, I believe this year. So I don't know what Anthropic spent, but I don't know. I guess they, I'll be interested to see what the angle even was. Yeah. So I like the Microsoft one. I thought it was good. I thought it was interesting. They didn't go after the enterprise audience. They were going after like the individual entrepreneur creator. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I did, you know, I, I guess none of them, I saw the CrowdStrike one. I didn't even make the connection. Like I was really confused by that one. It was like robots were like rolling in in the wild west. Yeah, and yeah. Like, CrowdStrike lady went out and like destroyed them by taking their robot clothes off or something and then they i don't know very much there was uh yeah and that ad was pretty stylized but yeah reading further about it it seems like it was in fact promoting some of their ai focused okay. cybersecurity features but yeah good luck knowing that exactly yeah. from the ad <laughs> yeah so yeah i mean we definitely expected you know the ai to play a role and it, it it was in it sounds like maybe like six or seven ads but go check out marty's story he's got some more details on the different ads and the strategies behind them so we'll we'll again we'll put the link to uh marty's uh, thread in in the show notes all right, so this next story is pretty wild. A finance worker at a multinational firm was tricked into paying out $25 million to fraudsters who were using deep fake technology to pose as the company's chief financial officer in a video conference call. And so this uh, is according to Hong Kong police, which is where this took place. So the scam actually saw this worker being duped into attending a video call with what he thought were several other members of his staff, but all of whom were in fact deep fake recreations. Now, this is not the first deep fake scam we've seen. It's not going to be the last by any stretch, but it is kind of the latest, more, most extreme reminder that we have that we now have deep fake video and audio that can essentially create indistinguishable fakes of real people. So, Paul, we talk pretty frequently about the fact that companies need a deep fake strategy. But like what kind of steps do we need to start taking here to prevent stuff like this from happening? Yeah, man, every time we talk about this, I just feel worse about where this is all going. Um I, so we're going to dig in next week to a main topic around some initiatives with major tech firms in the industry that are sort of coming together around some standards to authenticate content and and try and reduce disinformation and misinformation. And, and maybe we'll save that bigger conversation for that time because the big tech companies are absolutely aware of this. The governments are aware of this. Um, people know that there are major problems ahead, and I think we need to just take a look and, and maybe kind of synthesize for people some of the initiatives that are going on to give a little hope, because otherwise it's just me saying we're all in trouble here and it's not going to go great. Um, but that doesn't tell the whole picture of what is what is happening. So 
I don't know. Like, this is crazy. <laughs> the story was nuts. Uh, I think we're going to see lots of examples of this kind of thing. If something this advanced already happened, like it just sort of starts to make you worry about what else is going to be going on. Right. But yeah, let's um, let's definitely talk more about what's going on in a positive sense of maybe some of the progress being made on these issues, because I definitely think we can all agree these are major issues that are going to affect a lot of different parts of business and society. Mm. And we got to start kind of digging into what is going on and what else can the rest of us maybe do to help alleviate some of the pains that we're going to feel on this one. All right. So in our last topic for this week, we saw an interesting experiment with ChatGPT that actually raised some bigger questions about the nature of AI's impact on employment at consulting firms, like especially big ones like McKinsey. So this all started when a popular account on X named Car Dealership Guy, who has 444,000 followers, posted to his audience, which is car dealers asking how their month was going in terms of their business. His post got like almost 200 responses from owners of car dealerships. Now, here's where it gets interesting. One of the guy's followers used ChatGPT on those 200 or so responses to turn them into incredibly detailed market research on the current pulse of the car market. So this guy, car dealership guy, called this research truly incredible. And here's where kind of this bigger picture idea comes in, because someone else, an ex-user by the name of Liz Hoffman, posted in the reply, quote, this is literally thousands of people's jobs at McKinsey, et cetera, indicating that ChatGPT combined with easily obtained public social media data was able to perform tasks typically reserved for elite, highly paid consultants. As car dealership guy put it, quote, we're living in the future. Now, Paul, this may just be one scenario online, but it did catch our attention because if ChatGPT and other AI tools can do stuff like this on the fly, does this devalue what we traditionally hire elite consultants for? Well, it devalues it, but it certainly accelerates the creation of it. And and Liz is no like average Twitter user. I mean, she's she writes for Semaphore and a Wall Street Journal alum and author of a book called Crash Landing. <laughs> So when Liz tweeted, that's what caught my attention is her saying this is literally thousands of people's jobs at McKinsey. And I think she was like kind of half joking, but probably not. And I do think that as different industries start to look at the stuff that is data driven, repetitive, making predictions about outcomes and generative, those are kind of the four categories of identifying a use case. When you start to break that out and you look at the things that we spend a bunch of time doing and people pay consultants a bunch of money to do, you start to realize that, wow, like GPT-4 or Gemini Advance, like might actually be, not only will it do it in 30 seconds, it might be better than the $700 an hour I'm paying my consultant for. And that's a very disruptive future. Like, hmm. and, and this is why we've talked about that I don't think that the economy. And I certainly don't think most industries and business leaders are prepared for how disruptive this is going to be to knowledge work in the next like 12 to 18 months across every industry. And so I think it's just a really practical example of how, when you know what this stuff is capable of, you look at it differently. It's like car dealership guys just collecting some data and that's interesting to him. And he'll probably spend hours going through it. And someone else who knows what ChatGPT is capable of is like, well, let me just scrape all that and I'll Create this cool little summary of it in 30 seconds. Cool. The people who, <laughs> we've said this before, like the people who understand AI and can apply it have tremendous growth opportunities ahead. So I'm, I'm a big believer that like there will be disruption to jobs. The best thing you can do to position yourself to thrive in that disruption is to understand and use AI. And so it's not a promise that your job won't be impacted or that you won't be impacted by AI. But if you have capabilities other people don't have, and if you have an understanding of this technology in a way your peers don't, you have a far greater chance of not only surviving through this disruption, but thriving in the disruption. And I think that's over and over again, one of the key messages I hope people take away from our podcast, our newsletter, our courses, our talks that you and I give, like 
just take action and figure this stuff out and you're going to give yourself the best chance to succeed moving forward. Those are great words to end this week's podcast on, Paul. Thank you so much for breaking this all down for our audience. I just want to uh, give a very quick reminder that there are tons of items that we just don't have time for in each week's podcast episode. You can find those in our This Week in AI newsletter, which you can find at marketingaiinstitute.com forward slash newsletter. It breaks down more in depth all the topics we discussed today, plus all the ones we didn't get to. It's really great digest for your weekly update on what's going on in AI. Paul, thanks again. Thank you, Mike. I will talk with everyone again next week. Thanks for listening to The AI Show. Visit marketingaiinstitute.com to continue your AI learning journey and join more than 60,000 professionals and business leaders who have subscribed to the weekly newsletter, downloaded the AI blueprints, attended virtual and in-person events, taken our online AI courses, and engaged in the Slack community. Until next time, stay curious and explore AI.